Welcome to Talk Design, the show where creatives have conversations. I'm Adrian Ramsey and I'm your host. Having lived a life of design myself, I wanted to share with you the creatives that inspire me and in turn may inspire you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Adrian Ramsey and I'm your host on Talk Design. I started this podcast because I wanted to share the journey of design that I've had and that many others have had. And I find it inspirational talking to people globally about what makes design tick and what makes design create a better world for others. My journey has taken me from clothing globally, women's swimwear, performance sportswear, mountaineering, yachting, all these kind of genres where each place I would learn more and more about different specifics and how clothing can support those. Also, I've worked in innovation as a systematic innovation trainer and worked with the aerospace industry as well as the marketing industry and the design industry. And all my years of design, still my favorite is the built structure and interiors. And years of travel, and discovery, I constantly look at what the emotions are that are created by the built space. I consider myself a student of design for my whole life and will go on that way. Some of the things that I do to support this is my podcast and then workshops and masterclasses where I teach people about trends and design thinking and tours where I take people on tour with me and we go and discover different points of architecture or interior design globally. I always think that when you're passionate about something, one of the things that you should do is is you should share it. And so creating the podcast was my way of sharing my enthusiasm and the enthusiasm of others and their passions around design with you. I hope you really enjoy it. And I ask you, would you please drop us a line? Tell us what you think. Tell us what got you excited. It's so inspiring when we get messages from our listeners that tell us about the things that shifted in their life because of who they listen to. And it gives me the inspiration to dig deeper and find more people that I can bring to your ears so that you live a better design life. My guest on Talk Design today is Jean Collins. Now, Jean is a interior designer from Connecticut, just outside of New York. She is also an author and has an amazing book, which we're going to discuss today, as well as a speaker. And I would say she's a motivational speaker. She has this wealth of knowledge. And we've just been chatting a little bit and we're talking about sort of like the universe, manifestation, these kinds of things as well. We're going to dig into that and how that affects your wellness and mindfulness. It's going to be a fun and exciting conversation. (laughs) Jane, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adrian, for having me. I'm excited to be on your show and can't wait to talk more. It's going to be great. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I don't even know really where I want to start, but I'm going to start with asking for, give me the brief runway on there was this kid at some point that chose corporate America whilst in the background, there was a design brain running at a million miles an hour. How, Very, you know, go, go back to little kid. Tell me what that right. little bit of journey there is and what inspired yeah. you. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, a lot of times we have to decide, are we going to be in this like business corporate, very structured mindset? Are we going to be creative and are we a creative or not? And if you had actually asked me as a young person, was I creative? I would have said, no, I'm not a creative person. I'm much more analytical. And so I chose a career path that was very analytical. I ran a sales team. I was vice president of sales for an advertising team for 22 years. And that was a very analytical job. And what I found when I lost that job and really started to brainstorm about what would make me happy and what I wanted to do, I realized that I actually really am a creative and that I had a lot of passion in being creative. 
And that led me to start an interior design firm and then led me to become a writer and write a book and has led me to become a speaker. And if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have said, there is no way that is no, none of that is ever happening. Are you let's kidding go, me? Let's go. No way. 35 years ago. Never. I would have at, said at there's the 35 no years ago. When, so go, go to when you were, say, maybe, I don't know, 14 or 15, when you would have said you weren't a creative, but you're in really formative years, you know, like, you know, those that sort of, and but you're in years where you're getting, starting to get pushed for a decision. You know, the sports you play determine whether you have got it to keep going and playing a professional sport, for instance, or whether you're just going to be a social player, you know, the uh, drama club that you're a member of is starting to really step up to where you go to. Tell me about that person as a kid and there and what life was like and what you were seeing, because at some point, you, you I don't know, this path was destined. <laughs> Maybe it was back there. I, so it's funny, if you met my 15 year old self, you would not think I'm the same person. So the one thing that I did start doing when I was 15 is I lied on a job application about my age so that I could get a job because I wanted to start making money. And I wanted to start working. So I started working at 15 lying by saying you had to be 16 in our state to work. So I lied yep. and said I was and somehow nobody ever figured it out. And but I did that for two reasons. One, because I didn't like sports. And so I didn't really think I had a place. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go get a job. That'll give me something to do. And two, because I was raised in a household with a mother who constantly said we never had enough money. And I was raised by a single parent in a very wealthy town. And I don't want to say we were the poorest people in town, but we were close. And yeah. so I always felt like, okay, if I can go work and make my own money, then I can have more control over finances and that I don't have to live in a house where my mother's constantly telling me we can't afford anything. So I did it for two reasons. And then part of the reason of not being into sports and doing it, and I write actually a bunch about this in the book, was that I have now a very extroverted personality, having mm -hmm. been in sales, public mm -hmm. speaking. I actually went to college for a degree in communications and public speaking, but I'm actually at my heart an introvert. And so my 15-year-old self was very insecure very unstable, felt like I didn't fit in. And so by at least getting a job, I could fit in in that workplace because I had a purpose in that workplace. I was there to do a job and do something. And so it gave me something to do so I could avoid the fact that I felt really socially awkward. I felt unattractive and didn't feel like I fit in at 15 in this very wealthy town where I just didn't connect with anybody. So by going to go work, that gave me that path. So I think my creative side didn't get a chance to come out at all because I was just focused on, okay, we have to go work. We're going to go work. And yeah. I have worked so ever since. Pushed worked yourself, ever since. Yeah. You pushed yourself down the analytical road Correct. and didn't nurture the other road. Like you, you not necessarily right. closed it off, but didn't nurture it. So I didn't nurture it. But, but ironically now that, I mean, when you ask about it, so I went to college for a degree in communications uh -huh. and journalism and public speaking. So that is much more creative However, at the time that I did that, I, I was surrounded by people that all were going into business, living right outside of New York City. Everyone was going to work on Wall Street. So I thought, okay, if I go into sales, at least it's not as boring to me as finance because I mm -hmm. that I was never going to get into. But it's also not as creative as becoming a psychiatrist or a sociologist or sociology or all these other things that were sort of fluffy. They were deemed fluffy at the time. And yeah. so I thought, okay, I'll go into sales. Maybe I can do that. And through that path, you know, I forced myself to have to become extroverted and mm. forced myself to become outgoing and forced myself to become stronger and have more self-confidence. But ironically, that, that little girl still is very much inside of me all the time. I think it's probably it? healthy because, you know, like you say, ironically, however, that little girl inside of you obviously craves its own space and its renewal space and all these kinds of things for its own wellness. And then outside of that also knows how to step up into the space of the world that's outside of them, you know, like it's a really fine balance, this thing. And it, one could crush you otherwise without without Very some well kind said. of balance yeah you yeah you couldn't you couldn't 
excel or make magic. So I think there's like, it's really, whether you knew yourself at that point or when you discovered it, it's an interesting kind of like split. And I see lots of right. introverts that I know, because I'm obviously not, I'm an extrovert. <laughs> um, but with it, I look at them, my introvert friends, and it doesn't mean that they socially aren't engaging and all those things. It right. means where they need their renewal space and where that renewal yeah. space comes from. And, you know, I, my best buddy, he's like classic. I would see him probably most days of my life. He lives around the corner from us and he's an introvert. Yet he goes to lots of social occasions, not to talk to people, not to engage with people, but to be in a community, to be around community. Interesting. Because otherwise he wouldn't have community because he he'd lock right. himself away. Stay inside. But he knows right. he needs the community, but he doesn't right. need to be the center of attention or right. have a lot of energy pushed out of him or pulled out of him. Yep. He, he wants to be there. He's more the observer than the maker of right. that. Right. Yes. Right. Um, He's a casual participant. Yeah. And then yeah. It, it, it's fascinating to like, it's probably one of the reasons we're such good friends is I more take the lead on creating things and he right. more fills around that. Right. You know, he's the, I'd say, the more steady of us and I'm the more flighty of us. Right, um, of course, right, it's, yes. It's, it's, it's fast. My wife calls him my, my other wife. You there know? you go. <laughs> it's a good balance, though. It works. But it is, and it's very easy to do business with him. It's very easy to do anything with him, like travel right. with him, any of those things, do adventures, you know, all those things. And when I'm listening to what you were saying there about, you know, that that introverted person is still running in there. Right. Yeah. It, if you were just the extroverted person, you wouldn't know the sense of having to find the renewal. And I want to come back to this when we talk about design, right. obviously. Yes. Right. Um, yes. <laughs> because I think it's such a critical part of design and people don't necessarily know themselves, but I want to get into all this. Right. Um, <laughs> so you started a design business and you started that design business around COVID as well. I did. Yep. Yeah. I started and I officially started my business May of 2020, which was during the lockdown. Yeah. And yeah. I thank God you came from marketing and advertising. <laughs> I want to tell us a little bit about that as well. So here you go. You've left corporate America. And in fact, everybody has in New York City. They've all gone home. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Everybody's gone yeah. home. Yeah. Everybody's gone home. <laughs> everybody's and, gone. you know, every IT tech is putting keystroke on everybody's computer to check they are working while they're at home. Correct. And, you know, yep. the, the secret police are watching kind of thing. And we're all trying to struggle and work out our communication, you know, how we're going to communicate, how we're going to do it. I did, did you have to do any homeschooling? So I did. I did both of my um, interior de design degrees. I did online. Yep. Right. The schools were closed. The yeah. Schools were closed. Yeah. Okay. Imagine, imagine painting, painting and color theory. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Yep. You're taking pictures of it and your iPhone is automatically auto-correcting all of the colors and your teacher's yelling at you, telling you that it's wrong. And I'm like, it's not wrong in person. You can you only it's see not. it. And I'm like, and I hated the painting class to begin with. Like oh. it was, it was painful drafting when you had to draft one of the programs, you had to draft the old fashioned way, like you do, yep. right. Yep. You know, graph paper lines, yep. and you'd have to do it and mail it into them. Oh, and then they really? would only go into the school once a week to pick it up. And then they would pick it up. They would take it home. They would make their notes on it. And then they would mail it back to you. It took like a month to get feedback. To get feedback. Took them it took them till the end of the program because they kept thinking like everybody else, like we're going back soon, you know? Yeah, so it yeah. wasn't like, oh, let's come up with a strategy and a process that works long-term. It wasn't until I was almost done with that program nine months later that they had finally been like, scan everything. We'll do it in Adobe. We'll write comments on it because they were like, it's okay. You know what? We can be back next week in school. So just keep doing it the old fashioned way. 
I, yeah. I had to do old fat, huge old fashioned presentation boards, like on cork board and, and wrap them all up and send them UPS to these people. I was like, this is ridiculous. That, Cause you couldn't that, go in person. That's crazy. It is crazy. Crazy. Absolutely um, crazy. So you left your corporate job. You then had to decide that you were going to do this in design thing. Out of all the yep. things that you could have chosen to do, you just you dug into your real self and, and got closer to who you really were and decided that you were going to do design. You chose to self-fund that because yep. there was no patron to fund it for you. Correct. How long did you give yourself to be able to turn a dollar? So I had said, I need to make a profit by the second year. But one of the things I did, I had a very smart business coach when I started my business. And she had said to me, it is incredibly important that you pay yourself. You have to pay yourself. Even if you're not paying yourself a lot. Uh, I mean, I think this is really smart business advice, no matter what your business is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're paying yourself a lot. You have to pay yourself because you then feel like you're valued and you're part of the business. And even if your business loses money, it, it can't be that it lost money because it paid you. The business lost money because your expenses are too high. You didn't generate enough revenue, but it can't be, you can't have the mindset that the business lost money, but I paid myself. So therefore we're even, or I didn't pay myself and the business lost money. You need to be an asset to the business, just like the subscription you have to pay, you know, to AutoCAD to be able to do a business like we do, right? Yeah. And so I, I always paid myself, not a lot, but I always paid myself. And the first year the business broke even. And the second year the business made money. So, you know, it didn't make a ton of money, but because my expenses were high, mm -hmm. the difference is- I It was all investment. Money. It's all investment. And I come from a marketing and advertising background. And here I am, you know, 50 years old, starting an interior design business during COVID with, I mean, I live in a town with a wealth of other designers. So how are you going to get known? You have to spend money to build a brand. And so I hired a PR person, not even a year in, and I hired a business coach a year in also to help me learn the things I didn't know, because I didn't come from interior design. So I didn't understand purchase orders and the back, how do you order from a vendor and, yeah. you know, a warehouse, what, uh, the, where does the stuff go after you order it? Oh, it has to go to a receiver and sit in a warehouse. I had no idea. I didn't know that at all. Like they don't teach you about that in school. School doesn't teach you, doesn't teach you a lot of the business side of the business. It teaches you the design side and the theory side, but it doesn't necessarily teach you the business side. And many programs are like this for many industries. So I had to hire people to teach me what I didn't know. Because I didn't feel like I had a five-year runway to figure it out, trial and error. And well, I you had two years. Somebody else. You had two so years, I, and you're burning cash. Otherwise, yeah. yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And and yep. Mm -hmm. That so was why. That was stuff. why my question. Like at some point, yeah. you you choose how long you're a good investment for, and right. if you've done it at the start with your high analytics, if you've done it at the start, then you go, okay, I know what I need to get to to get to this next point, and I think that. You know, like I look at kids today. How old does that make us feel when we say that? <laughs> but I look at kids today and, you know, the opportunities are endless of what they can do. And whether they're focused on investing in themselves, whether that's financially or education-wise or whatever, the the fact that if they can make a you know a reverse engineered plan of if I'm not here then I need to I, at these points then I need to relook at that this isn't right. taught in school Seven. it isn't no. taught anywhere and you know we were talking before about before we started recording about being listening and being aware and what opportunities sit in there and if you don't have a plan that's somewhat aligned to where you're going to, you'll run off sideways constantly and never right. get to the plan, never get down the road. You know, a, a plane on autopilot knows its destination. And so it's right. how it takes that journey. It won't stay. It might right. be on course 30% of the time, 10% of the time. Right. It's sure. about correction, correction, correction. Correct. But, you Correct. know, you don't want to end up in... Ohio when you were planning right. on being yes. in Toronto, you know, those Correct. things don't right. work. They yeah. Do not work. Yeah. I, nope. A big shout out to, you know, good business coaches and 
good team, good PR people. Yes. Because yes. what they They're know, everything. yeah, what you know, yeah, what they know and what you know are different things. And are different know. things. Yeah. And I did learn that from corporate America. And a lot of times people ask me, you know, what was the biggest thing you learned from your career in corporate America? And that is the biggest thing is that you need a team of people. And when you become an entrepreneur and you start your own business, you have to do everything. And that's just the reality. You don't have a huge team of people. But I think in order to be successful, what you have to really identify at the beginning is what are your strengths and what are you going to then outsource? And what things are you going to have to generate the revenue and the resources to hire people to bring those skill sets to you? Because you cannot be the jack of all trades. You just can't and run a successful business because your skill set is different than someone else's. And so my PR person, you know, knows people I have would have never met and would have uh-huh. never known and has a skill uh-huh. set I don't have, even though I have a marketing background, but I yep. don't. My business coach, a wealth of wisdom. And it was a lot of money, you mm-hmm. know, and it was. And even when I interviewed with her and she's like, look, I know this feels like a lot of money, but you have to make the choice. Are you willing to invest that money in yourself and your business to learn what you need to learn in order to help you build a business and grow? And the answer had to become yes. And so, and then I absorbed every piece of, you know, coaching. Well, you put a lot of classes. value on it. A <laughs> yeah, lot of value. But, but it was really, I say to people all the time, if you want to start a business, do your research to find a good business coach. Even if you can't hire them at the beginning, know who they are and know who those people are oh. for when you're ready and you can. Because I've got a question around that. Yeah. So with business coaches and mentors, so a, a guy that I know, he always, oh no, I don't want to tell you this. What do I want? To, I've got to frame my question better here. With in choosing a business coach or a mentor, and, and we'll say for business, not necessarily for life, but for business. What type of what kind of things would you look for in choosing the right person? And I want to give you the example of how they made their money or how, who they are best aligned with. So, you know, like you, you've got a business coach and obviously the alignment was good. Yes. The, the, the alignment was strong. And whether you consciously interviewed well for that or whether you, <laughs> we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I made a good choice. <laughs> yeah. Or whether you got lucky, intuition got you there, maybe whatever. Because the money's spent in whichever way. And just tell me a bit about that process of deciding who and how. And and I've got some more questions around that. So part of it is that what we were talking about before, when something comes across your desk and it gives you pause, don't keep Mm -hmm. going. Or if you keep Mm -hmm. going, go back to it. And because sometimes that has come across your desk for a reason. And it could be a sponsored ad on Instagram that keeps showing up. And it's like, why is that showing up? That's because you paused. That's why. And the it, algorithm it said you want more of you it. You paused, <laughs> right. You paused. But why did you pause? What yeah. in it made you pause, right? And so maybe that means you should investigate that just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And my business coach I had found online because I had, you know, been following a whole bunch of interior designers and interior design, you know, mentors, people, businesses, things like that. And she did a free seminar she did a free hour and a half seminar that was and I participated that was her marketing was a free seminar so I participated in her free seminar and then at the end you could sign up to have an hour-long class you know Uh conversation with her about how to potentially use her services so this was her this was her funnel funneling you in yeah correct she gets you in and and so in the seminar she gave you good value she did. That's what it is, is, is her seminar resonated with me in terms of what I wanted to learn. And so yes. I was very clear about what I didn't know and what I wanted to learn and what I was looking to get out of it. And the kicker, her, her 
cherry on the top of her sales pitch to me was she had on part of her team, a mindset coach, and you would meet with the mindset coach every month. And you had to sign up for a year of coaching, but you would meet with the mindset coach every month. And you would be part of a team of people that would also meet with the mindset coach. And so she provides a team environment. So I was like, oh, wow, I can get to meet with other interior designers that don't necessarily live where I live and that are collaborative and helping us grow and understand the business and understand business challenges, but yet not be competitive because we're not in the same neighborhood. Uh -huh. And I thought that could really help someone like me who doesn't really know a lot of people in this industry. And I don't know what's normal. I don't know how to handle situations. And so what? So her emphasis on mindset in addition to business process is really what got me hooked because that to me was important was the mindset part and the team environment that she exposed me to, because I really felt like I could really learn a lot by finding some other friends in this industry. Te team that, and community. Yeah, team, right. Team and community. And also mm -hmm. just learning from other people's experiences. Mm -hmm. And we would get on calls every week. She would have open forum calls for an hour and a half every week and anyone could join. And you could ask any question of her and her team that you wanted about a, a project that was going on. And it sure. could be about how to close a deal, mm -hmm. a situation with a client, uh, mm -hmm. You know, how this is affecting your life work balance. I mean, anything you want, you could ask. And so even if you didn't, if I didn't personally have something to ask, I could listen to other people's stories Merit and learning. Hear, learn yeah. it. Right. Exactly. So for me, it wasn't just her as a coach. It was the package that she delivered. And I think my advice to people that are looking to find a business coach, you have to be very clear on what you want to know or where you need help and what you want to learn from that person. And I was very clear about what I needed. And she managed to check off, you know, 98% of boxes. the boxes of yep. what I needed at that time. And I used her for two years. And then, you know, I had gotten what I had needed out of it. And then we parted ways. And it's nothing to do with her. It's, you know, I learned what I wanted to learn. Yeah. And then it was yeah. time for me to find other things and yeah. find other ways to I keep think growing it, my business. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand, like, just what you said, again, what, are, what, are, where am I? not where am I deficient as such where do I need the help and Correct. then what does that help need to look like so that I can absorb it and this was where I was going when I said oh I'm not going to say it not going to tell you that this guy that I've, I've dealt with over many years he always says you know make sure that your mentors made their money the same if it's about money for business right Sure. And, and, and go beyond money if it's about customer type, those kind of things. Make sure your mentors made the money the same way that you want to. Right. So if we look at business, for instance, you know, you take someone who is, for instance, I'm going to use Richard Branson as an example. Mm -hmm. Richard Branson, he is an introvert. He speaks a lot publicly, but he's an introvert. You know, it's all hard work for yep. him to do the speaking. He yep. also is dyslexic, so he doesn't read wow. lots. He's like he's right. a big he's a big adv advocate for dyslexia. Okay, he is a creator in the thing of he creates things. He doesn't do mm -hmm. the detail that makes them work. He right. creates the opportunities. Sure. Um, yep. And then if we took, say, Oprah Winfrey. She right. is a magnet. She's a star. She drags okay. people with her energy. Yeah. Now, if you go, you know, like around a spectrum of things, you will have people who are like a trader, for instance, somebody who buys and sells and makes on the buying and the selling. Right. When you've got those things, if you're not a person who would hustle, buy and sell, buy and sell and buy and sell, your coach may not be, it may need to be the person who you're more aligned with right. in their method. Yeah. Because right. then when they're speaking, you can apply it really easily. Right. It's quick that, learning. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's yeah, it's congruent, I suppose. It, it's congruent with who you are. And then right. their values need to match. Yes. Because yes. if their values don't match, then you're always going to be in question. Right. You're always going to wonder, can yeah. you should you take their advice? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And do they really what you don't want to be doing is questioning your coach or your mentor and feeling like they really don't understand me or they really don't understand my situation uh -huh. because 
that's why you have them. You have them because they actually do understand your situation because they actually have been in your shoes before or something similar. And they have a lot that they can teach you. Uh -huh. and, and that's why you have a coach and they do have a different perspective. You don't want a yes person. You do want someone who's going to force you to kind of look a little outside your, your comfort zone a little bit and outside your boundaries. You know, like my business coach was like, you have to do a monthly newsletter. I was like, you got to be kidding me. No way. I have no interest. You have to do one. And she's right. I do. And yeah. I do now do it. And I've been doing it for three years. And she is right. It's my, it's the connection to my audience. It's the touch point. It's exposing them to new design ideas. It's exposing them to my book or events or, but it's a constant touch point. And she is right because it does keep me top of mind. It's a really good marketing tactic. And it's also something that forces me to think about the value that I want to bring every month to my let's audience of you yeah. know, subscribers. What do I want them to learn this month? What do I want to teach them? What can I share with them? How can I help them? Yeah. And this 100%. month I just did a peek into my own house and I oh. shared, I did a peek into an interior designer's house because I had someone ask me recently, what does your house look like? Yeah. Right. What's your house like? Yeah, And I was like, oh, you know what? Let me show you what my house looks like because it might not look like what you think it looks like on the outside and yeah. I'll show you. And that's what I did my newsletter on was a peek into my own home. So if and you're listening to this and you want to see Jean's home, you need to sign up for her newsletter. Exactly. That's I'll happily it. send you yeah. some pictures yeah. of it. Yeah. And if, if you sign up for a newsletter, is there a comment section in signing up for your newsletter? Can you people can. comment? Say Absolutely. that you were listening to the podcast and that you want to see that newsletter in particular. Exactly. <laughs> yep. You can do it on um, my website. Absolutely. Uh, we'll tag it at the end. Yeah. I want to segue this piece of your business coach to ideal client. And we were talking earlier about unless there's an alignment, there's no magic made. It becomes it becomes a labor, but not one of love anymore. It becomes a labor. And this ability to find your ideal clients and your ideal clients to find you. Now, you know, marketing's marketing. But that thing of right. taking your intuition and going, you know what? This is the this is the client for me because we can make magic. Tell me about that. Yeah. So, you know, when I, so when I started my business, you know, my, I had a, a free business coach from the small business association, oh, nice. right. Yeah. At, which was great. Oh my goodness. Yeah. He was amazing. And he was like, you really need to define your target market. I'm like, I'll, de I'll design for anybody who has money. Yeah. Anybody who has money. Yeah. <laughs> How much money they anything. got? I can design right. for that. I can design for anybody. <laughs> I can do any style I'll design for anybody. And he's like, that's not going to work. <laughs> he's yeah. like, you know this, you need to start. And I was like, okay. And honestly, it took me a couple of years. I mean, I revamped my website three times in the first two years. I changed my logo four times in the first two years. It took me a long time to really decide and and how I did it is I didn't focus on the end game of the project I focused on the person and you and I were talking about this mm -hmm. because it's all about the person and who do I who's that person that I want to spend time with not necessarily I want the project to be this size house in this town this style whatever so it's really focusing on who's my target audience in terms of that person and how is our interaction together and what do they want out of a journey of hiring an interior designer and is that a good match? And so like you and I were joking about, you know, I people hire me to shop. So if someone comes to me and they're like, I love shopping, I want to shop with you, but that's not why I want you as a client. I don't actually want you shopping with me. That slows down everything and like totally impedes my creative yep. process and how I work. So what I want for a client is someone who wants me to shop and that's what they're hiring for is to shop and bring it back to them. 100%. So over time, I really have refined it and realized like I need entrepreneurs, I need busy executives because I can understand that I was in that world in corporate America. So the way I approach a project and business is very relatable to them. I am willing to meet on a weekend. We meet for an hour. There is a spreadsheet. There is an agenda. It is very process oriented. And that works with busy executives because, uh -huh. you know, they're hiring you for a reason. They don't have the time to yeah. do what you do. Or, or, or the skill. Or yeah, the, the skill, sc but the they skill, really but the feel time. like time is money, you mm -hmm. know, and time is money for an executive. And because of my background, I have great respect and understanding for that. And so I've found that that client base for me 
really appreciates my background and how I bring that because a lot of designers can be quite honestly, very flighty and all over the place. And that's because they're stuck to in the creative. So it's hard to have, it, not everybody has the combination of the analytics and the creative into one person. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I've also found, you know, I really like people who want to talk about mindset and wellness and how do you feel in your home? And let's talk about the energy of your house. And if I speak like that to some people, you might just get this glaze. And then, <laughs> and you, know like, the, you, know then you know the magic then can't happen. Right, yeah. right exactly. Because yeah. I'm like, and that's okay. And then you talk to other people and you say that and they're like, oh my goodness. Hey, I did Reiki last week. Have you ever tried Reiki? And I'm like, oh, you're my person. Here we go. You know, yeah. like we can relate. We can bond. We can talk about that. We can talk about the power of color. We can talk about the power of light. We can, you know. Feel, touch, space. Exactly. Uh, like light. that is, yeah. that yeah. is my type of client. And then once you can connect with that person, then you find that then they connect with you and yeah. then they're equally as excited about their project mm -hmm. as you are about them. Because mm -hmm. that's when the, like you say, the magic really happens when you're both so equally excited about creating this space that oh, no yeah. one you're creating a space that at the time that you go into it, neither of you really know what it's going to be at the end. And it's the it, excitement it grows, for the journey. Yeah, grows. 100%. And that's 100%. like, and that's why we do this. That's like, mm -hmm. you know, the fun and the energy and the creativity that get us so excited about the possibility of how do we push the boundaries of not only them, but our creativity. We don't want to redesign something we already did for somebody else's house. At least I don't. No. I, I'm not looking... No. You know, I'm I don't you. want someone to come to me and be like, I want that room that you, you know, that room on your website. I want that. I'm like, okay, yeah. that is, that, yeah, okay. Yeah. That room was that? for, that room was for so and so. So we might be able to do exactly that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And that yeah. was for them. And yeah. for us as creatives and as designers, I think what gets us so excited about a project is the newness of it. And it's a little scary. Like there's always people 100%. say, do you have fear when you start a project? And I'm like, yeah. Hell There's yeah. always a little bit of fear of like, can I actually do this? Like, can I really deliver the edge that I think I want to get to with this project? And the anticipation of the journey is, you know, it's a step into the, the unknown as such as to how it will unfold. You have to be very right. in the space of trusting your own self, having your own self-confidence yeah. in place, right. as well as being able to read the person and you know it's like peeling back an onion you, you you're finding pieces as you go and you're trying to do that kind of at rapid speed as well like oh, it's like speed yes. dating uh, on, on a whole lot of stuff but they're going to be left with the result right you you yeah. go home you go home right but they've got the result They've got the result of it and it's their home. And and I don't know if you do this. Sometimes at the end of the project, I will just like, I kind of take a pause and I look at the space and I look at the, the family and I just think like, by the time you get to the end, your relationship with them is so drastically different from that first initial phone call. Mm -hmm. And I am always so in awe at how quickly, you know, we're family, like how yeah. quickly, you know, everything about them mm -hmm. and everything about how they live and how they function where they travel they to do, what they do what time the kids interests. are picked up everything yeah their interests, you've like, been through every illness yeah. you've been yeah. through, you know maybe you've even been through a job loss or a job change or yeah. so much has happened and it's i am always just so amazed at how quickly the relationships evolve and get mm -hmm. to evolve with our clients and what we do and you know and, and how a, many clients at the end are so grateful it's an intimate relationship them. as well in the sense that it's very you you're you're creating a in their home and right. so you're deep in their emotions and their feelings yes. and their you know challenges of right. of life because those yeah. inform how you make how you may choose to design and totally. you know you were yeah. talking before about formula and, you know, whether you just cookie cut formula, I certainly know that I've designed similar type things over and over. Right. However, they become formula when I go, we need this much space or we need this much maneuverability or we need, that's where the formula right. is. Right. But I always look at it and go, I've done this before. How can I break this? 
right. how can, how yeah, can yeah. I reinvent right. this? How can I make it a little bit different? And also, what haven't I learned about these people that maybe I need to learn more about? Right. Yeah. So right. have I have I got everything? Because I know this is this a solution, but right. is it the right solution that really will work for them? I have a I have one that one of my formulas is if I've got a, a younger couple and they're going to have kids and a male female couple. Right. Yep. And they've either just got kids or they're going to have kids and we're designing yeah. a house, not not yeah. not doing interiors, maybe interiors, but right. designing a house, is I always give the woman the shortest road to A, being able to get up and look after a child if need be, yep. B, to get to the en suite so that yep. they don't walk into the corner of the bed or sure. any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and then yep. also with the ensuite, making sure it's well positioned so that it can be quiet from the bedroom. Because if some right. blokes rolling out of bed on the other side and stumbling around and making right. a noise, they're awake. They're right. awake Everybody's like this. Awake. They're already right. sleep Everybody deprived. Knows. Yeah. Yep. And then where the light's going to come from as well, oh, so that yes. if they can get to sleep you know, and get that extra sleep. Now that's a different house than you designed for somebody who doesn't have kids at that stage, you know, Correct. and sometimes we've even designed like walk-in closets bigger because they go, well, when we had our first child, we, you know, put the bassinet in our room, Right. we could, if we could put it in the walk-in closet, that right. would work Have really well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've designed it that yeah. way. And so because men and women have different yeah. spatial awareness because of their testosterone levels and things and their hormone levels, you know, I'm always looking and going, okay, so I don't want you to get out of bed and stub your toe, partly because you'll wake right. me up. The other, <laughs> the other part of it is I care about your toe just enough right, that I don't right, want you to exactly. wake me up. Yeah. Yes. And, but it's yes. this kind of thinking and it's you know, different. whether a door handle is on the left which way is the door going to swing and what shapes the door right. handle will I be able How's to do that work? with my hands full will I be able to you know can I open it with my elbow will I be able to right. pull it towards all these exactly. things these are formula yeah and then Definitely. formula with context so I find those pieces right. really interesting in my analytics right um, yes but then how do you break that every time to approach it freshly right I think right. is really fun Really, and really you're fun. adding, I think what you don't realize is you're adding so much value. I find when I have a potential client that doesn't have children yet, and I have a child, my mm -hmm. viewpoint on how that life is, and to your point, you've done this enough that you can add the value of things they would never think of. Mm -hmm. because you can think about how are they actually going to live and function in this environment in that different stage of life. And that is that I think gives you so much power and the ability to add so much value because that's knowledge. They're not going to go get that at YouTube somewhere. No, They're not no, going to Google that. No, you know, that's, you that's don't get the that. value you get. You bring as a that's, designer. That's exactly it. Like there's so much, you know, HGTV is not going to teach you this and no. That is it may make you aware though. It may help you be more it aware, but it won't teach bit. you it. Yeah. It won't teach you all of that and all of the things to think about. And and it's and it, it can be overwhelming. It's like anything else. There can be so much that it's overwhelming to be like, well, you know, it, you're paralyzed by a hundred percent. A hundred percent. And getting clarity and getting it broken down into clean lines so right. that you can actually make a, a forward movement. Um, oh, decision. Tell me about being a author and I know that you wrote your book you self-published it and also mm -hmm. you recorded it I did yeah I love that yeah that was a journey learning how to do that you got to keep learning I, I think you've got a great voice so I think I could very Thank easily you. listen to your book as in you've got a a lovely uh, tone to your voice that is easy to listen to thank you and from that point of view it's like to take it though you know, first time author, yep. write the book and yep. then get all ballsy with it and go, I'll record that too. Um, <laughs> well, I knew I had to. Tell me about that journey. That wasn't a choice. So, <laughs> so that journey goes back to, you know, saying yes when something makes you pause. 
I had oh I had expressed for several years that I thought it'd be really cool as a designer to have a coffee table book. What designer uh-huh. doesn't want a coffee table book? We all want one, right? And I thought, you know, if I wrote a book one year, it might be kind of cool to have a coffee table book. And I don't know what words of wisdom from a design perspective yet I would want to share with the public and how I can teach people and educate them on something. But, you know, give me long enough in this business, I'll figure it out because I want there to be value. Mm-hmm. And I got an email about a company that was doing an hour and a half Zoom class about writing your own book, writing a book. And I kind of passed it. And then it was going through my emails and I saw it again and I opened it and I looked and I was like, you know what? My calendar's free during that hour and a half. I'll sign up. It was a free Zoom call about writing a book, how to write a book. And I thought, you know, why not? I'll learn about it now. I don't want to write one yet. I'm going to write one in five years, but why not? I have the time. So I signed up for it. And by the time the hour and a half was over, part of it was mind mapping. So for people who don't know what that is, that's basically brainstorming about what your book is going to be like. By the time we were done with that hour and a half, I had an entire memoir mapped out. Mapped out. We had mapped out chapters, subjects, subsubjects. I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, because if you are in a creative space, like we are and you're left to brainstorm, it goes slowly, but then all of a sudden it's like a blah, a dump. Yes. You know? Cause once you let all it, of happen, a sudden, yeah. all of a sudden it's like, you know, and you might be like this with your projects. Like all of a sudden I get crazy creative, like in the middle uh-huh. of the night, I mm-hmm. will see the space. I will see mm-hmm. the, like it is as clear as day to me. And then it's like, okay, well, how do I make that space? And how, how do I capture do I that? Move? And yeah. how do I, how do I get what's in my brain and what walls do I have to move? And how do I furnish that? And how do I build this? And how do I, you know, how do I get what's in my brain to somebody else? But all of a sudden it comes to you because your brain does this creative do, dump. Do you know with the, the, the piece on how, what walls do I move? Yeah. I have a glass or well, two, three glass walls in my shower. And yeah. of course they steam up. So yeah. I I often will stand in the shower st- and go, that goes there, that goes yeah. there, that goes there. My oh. wife will look at me going, you're designing something? Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Yep, I've got it. And that, oh. that then that would give me this and then that would give me this. And then uh-huh. that, once I've physically done it with my finger on the on the glass, because yes. it's going yes. away as I'm doing it, remember. Of it's course it is, right. Again. But you're you're doing it. Yes, but the yeah, the neurological path is right. actually then locking it in more and it's making sense and the jigsaw is now running. You know, I've Correct. said it with the universe or the Godiverse that I have a yes. problem to solve. Yep. yep. And with that problem to solve, what is that going to be? What is it going to um, look like? And yeah, and then that gives me my next... Uh, I suppose ability to then go and sit and draw it or to go to then move to the next instruct somebody else to right you know we need that soft we need that hard we need that light coming this way but we know that's east or west or whatever it is right so we know we need to filter it this way we need to do these things so my my shower box great other people might I'm telling you I don't oh, <laughs> I, I solve so many problems in the shower I solve them in the shower or and I solve them out walking yeah right so yeah, it's out like walking it, as well. Out walking yep. is a big one for people who are creative. You yep. need to clear your your brain, yep. and then all I of actually, a sudden, once you quiet it, stuff comes in. And I think also movement, because yep. movement mm-hmm. takes up some of the frenetic energy that we have that right. allows the other to get space. Correct. You know, right. like exactly. I think that makes a difference as well. Your book, two feet My book. in, right? Yeah, two yeah, feet yeah. In, lessons weird. from an all in life. Yeah. And how did that title come about? It's crazy. Come on. Give, <laughs> give me the runway on that. I like I love well, the title, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, so after I did my mind, take one step back, after I oh. did this Zoom class, right, with the mind mapping, and I was like, oh my goodness, I have an entire book. Like I could share my story and I really think people could learn from it. And I could be giving back and I could be helping people. I decided I was going to write a book. And similar to how I started my business, I decided I was going to write a book and I went and I hired, I, I know nothing a about book writing a book. Yeah. I did. I know nothing about writing a book. I know nothing about publishing a book. I was like, I am raise my hand right here. I know nothing about doing that. So I hired a book coach. And so I hired a company to walk me through that process. And as soon as I did that, I fully committed that I was going to write every day from five to six and every night. And I did not consider myself a writer at all. I mean, I write well. I went to school for communication so I can communicate and I can write well, but I never considered myself an author. 
but I was like, Hey, I seem to have this story. So let's give it a shot. And so, so I did. So I wrote my book and in the process of writing my book and writing my memoir and then rewriting it and then rewriting it. <laughs> Not because times. you're a control freak or <laughs> Took a couple of times, but, right? Yeah. To get it right, right? You got to do it a whole bunch of times. In that process, the title came about because what I realized was the way that I approach challenges in life is with two feet in. And not everybody can do that. And I can't take full credit for the title. The title actually came from someone else. I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine and he mentioned it to me. And I was like, you're right. That is how we were talking about how I deal with problems and how I've approached life and sort of this running theme throughout my book. And he was like, you jump two feet in. I'm like, I do. And he's like, that should be the title of your book. And I was like, wow. Once again, it's that moment. Take a pause. It comes to you. And I had said no at first. I was like, no, no, no. I have a title. It's something different. No, no, no. And I came back. I kept coming back to it. And I was like, that actually is it. My daughter jokes that my next book is going to be called Three Feet In as a sequel. And she thinks you know, she's 17. Her and her 17-year-old friends. I'm with your think daughter. That's I think that's great as well. Yeah, yeah. I laugh every single yeah, time. I love it. It comes up yeah. all the time. They're like, how's Three Feet In coming? Yeah. Like, three feet in strong. with only two feet. <laughs> three feet yeah. With only two feet, right? <laughs> you know, but- it's a metaphor really for uh-huh. how I approach problems. And, and it's a couple of things like lots of people will be like, oh, you're all in, you jump all in. Mm-hmm. I, that is, yes, that's true. There are lots of people who do that. But the part that is unique about how I have found I handle challenges, I've been divorced twice, changed careers, started businesses. You're is, a busy woman. <laughs> I, I know, right? <laughs> it, so it's not just being all in because that, especially in sports, like you can be all in. It's being all in and not second guessing that decision that you've made for yourself at the crossroad. And so being all in and then shutting that part of your brain down that talks to you and is like, no, 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 you can't do this. You're going to fail. What do you know? How are you? You're not good enough for this. The imposter, like shutting that part off in my brain. And it's like, nope, I made this decision. This is what I'm doing. This is the path I'm going in. And now I'm going full speed ahead. And I don't let that self doubt stop me. And what I found from talking to a lot of other people is that that self-doubt paralyzes so many people because they don't trust themselves enough and they start to trust themselves and they start to think they're going to move forward. And then they let that self-doubt take over. And I ironically am not the most self-confident person in some ways, but yet I've managed to figure out how to quiet the chatter in my mind so that I can kind of close the door on the self-doubt and just move forward because you know what the universe will provide and it will work out. It just will. And having enough trust in my decisions and myself and my process, and maybe it's having trust in my process and making decisions that have gotten me to where I am. Yeah. Yes. If you you take take action action. and that's it, you have to make the decision and then all your actions forward need to be forward moving action Mm -hmm. steps towards whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, don't just sit there and tell me all the time that you hate your job. What are you doing about hating yeah, your job? Yeah, if you, okay? Like well, you hate your job. Well, what are you doing about that? Yeah, right? Yeah. Like let's build a game plan for getting you out of that job. Well, or you want For to, God's like, sake, do your employee a favor and get out of the job. Right. Exactly. Like they don't so, need you to sit there hating it. Get right, out. No, Let somebody in the seat not, that loves it. Like, like right. why block same the thing. space? Yeah. Right. And do it for yourself, and, and same but do thing, it for your employer, do it for the Do it for everybody person. else. Right. Yeah. Because your energy is not helping anyone yeah. and it's not helping 100%. you either. So yeah. it's like you have to, in some ways, people have to, one of my hopes is that I can inspire people to give themselves permission to make themselves and their happiness a priority and not have that be viewed as a negative narcissistic way of living. It's okay to say, I'm going to make this choice because it's the right choice for me. And I'm going to choose me and my happiness and my inner peace. And that's okay because if you are in a better space and you have greater inner peace, you have that much more to give to everybody else around you. And your energy helps that everybody else. Well, it's not about being selfish. No. It's about making you a priority. But when you do that, you then can give back so much more. And it's the giving back and the energy that goes out that I want people to see that 100%. can really be making a difference because I, you make that choice to make yourself a priority first. Yeah. Yeah. I go back to that saying, you know, you can't give what you don't have. And Correct. if you, yeah. if you, 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 no, you and, if you're depleted and you and... will give what you do have. And so right. there's the mindfulness, yes. you know, like the flip flop. If you're right. 
in you know distress or hatred or you know scarcity or any of those things that's what you're giving and it's a vibrational yeah. energy and then on the other side of it, if, if you in a in an abundant mindset and in generosity and in health and happiness and those right. things then that's what you can give from there then that's what you give i've got some uh, little questions around this like so we we started a little conversation earlier where i said so you wayne dyer fan and you're like oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a Bren, a Brené brown fan oh yeah yeah, yeah. love um, love esther hicks love oh my goodness oh. youtube videos oh man <laughs> listen to those all the time all the time um, 20 minutes 20 minutes of wisdom that like, can change your life and change your mindset get onto youtube listen to those under yeah, any es subject esther hicks is just uh, yeah like she's my amazing go-to when i go oh i like I, i'm always in the playlist but i right. go oh some esther right now would actually yeah. just 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 kick that whatever it is because i never know what i'm going to actually right. listen to yeah that will just kick that to touch any, will. any of that will work and she's so brutally honest oh god i love it i love it <laughs> ah, i love it i love it people talk about their problems they say things but she is so brutally on no that is not your problem <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so all listeners out there if you if any of this we've just talked about resonates go and listen to some esther hicks some wayne Absolutely. dyer oh. wayne dyer what well, tell me about your wayne dyer experiences uh, like, you know so I Wayne Dyer was one of the first people that I started to listen to because my stepmother, when I was younger, probably my twenties or thirties, turned me on to him. And so I started to listen to him and it was before I knew or understood. This anything. would have been back at erroneous zones and yeah, things like, like that. Yeah, And it was, but it was before I understood anything about mindset or anything, you know? And so it was like, oh, okay, there's this different way to start thinking. And so I look at him as like the, the grandfather of when I was younger, you know, mm -hmm. like sort of this rock of someone who was talking about it. And now we're blessed with all these people, you know, like we were talking about Gabby Bernstein, right? Who've yeah. like taken that wisdom to like, and even Esther Hicks wisdom, like Gabby talks about that too, like taking that wisdom to a whole nother level and made it so accessible and almost modernized it, I feel like. Mm -hmm. it like for modernized it for us and by courses and all these things. And so I feel like Wayne Dyer was like at the foundation of really They've thinking given about us access to it. And they have, and thinking about, you know, the universe and the mm -hmm. power of the universe and the power of thinking and what even is abundance, what even is manifestation, what role does God play in your life or not even God faith. You know, it doesn't yeah. have to be about yeah. God. It's about faith. And you have faith and believe in, you believe in anything. It doesn't have to be a, a God. It's faith that there's something out there that can help you and guide you. And so I feel like those were like the early beginning days of the foundation. And so, you know, it's fun to be able to still follow along on Instagram. And, you know, I think Wayne Dyer's kids like run his Instagram now and stuff, which they do. is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Which I think cool um, to like keep keep the messages going i'm just writing myself a little note to come back to here tell me about well do you know jose silva i do not and the silver method of mindset i do not Ooh, i do not cool. writing this one for right you now. this right. one for you so uh, he's from texas originally and he this is old stuff, uh, like old, and okay. it's about alpha brain waves and operating from your alpha brain waves, and it's known as the silver method, okay. and it's yeah, about using really your clairvoyant abilities and tapping into working from your alpha brain waves. You will, you will, we will have more conversations about this. Interesting. Um, All right, the silver method. Well, you mentioned yeah. tapping, so that reminds me of Nick Ordner and tapping, which I'm a huge fan of tapping. Yeah, right. I just so, found out about that like a year ago, and I was like, oh. My wife of, does that. Yeah, my wife's love. into that stuff. Oh, tapping is great. Tapping <laughs> is great. <laughs> what There's about, so much. There is you know, so you much. Try it all. You got to try it all. What about Brene Brown? Obviously, we love. We do. 
but the, I remember this first thing when my wife said to me, oh, there's this interesting lady talking on vulnerability. I'm like, what's that shit? You know? <laughs> yeah, the, daring the, the, greatly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This thing of what was vulnerability? Like, what did it even mean? And what yeah. does it mean in a daily context? So tell me a little journey of yours with that. Oh, and yeah. So vulnerability. Wise. Yeah, vulnerability is a tough one, right? So vulnerability for my book uh, is cra- is a lot. So when I was starting to write my book, I had to really decide how much of my story of my life I was going to talk about and how much was I going to actually share about the decisions. And like I said, I've been divorced twice. I grew up, uh, you know, with divorced parents and, you know, the poor kid in town and, you know, got picked on and all of that. And nothing that other people, I think what's so interesting is there's a lot about my story because I wrote it from a very vulnerable point of view that people say, I can relate to that chapter two, how you grew up. I can relate to that. That was me too, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was a point in writing my book that I decided that I had to make a choice about how much I was going to share about my life and, and being with this introvert extrovert. You didn't get a choice. I can tell you that now you've got an all in life. I, well, I had to decide, (laughs) like, are you going to be vulnerable? And I think if you're willing to be, what I decided in writing the book was if my goal was to help people make changes in their lives. And I felt like that was my purpose is to be able to share my, my lessons and my message to help people live a better life. In order to do that, people have to be able to connect with me in some capacity. And in order to do that, you have to be willing to be vulnerable. And so you have to be willing to put it all out there. And that means that you have to be authentic to yourself and you have to be your true self and be prepared that not everyone is going to like that. And that needs to be okay. You have enough strength to say that needs to be okay. But by being vulnerable, you're being true to yourself. And I think I can demonstrate in my book and when people meet me, you know, I'm like, that is a good choice. You know, Mm -hmm. it's a good Mm -hmm. choice. And have I lost friends over that because of the book? Yep. Do I have family members who don't support the book and who don't speak to me anymore? Yep, I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because then they can't see the bigger picture of why I did it and why, what my platform is and my purpose. And I think if we're fortunate enough to have platforms like we do with podcasts and social media and speaking and all of this and the ability to really help people improve their lives, and that's the platform we've been given, we owe the platform vulnerability and we own, we owe our audience vulnerability and and authenticity and authenticity. We do. We owe them that. We owe them that if we're really genuinely trying to help people with our message and our thoughts and our knowledge, then we need to be vulnerable and authentic and be who we are. And if people don't like that, oh, well, I'm sorry Uh, for you. And that's okay. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Everybody is where they're at and they're not always ready to get to another space and they may not have the ability or want to or anything else as well. And that's okay. And Um, that's okay. Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights. So I've read about half of it. Yeah. <laughs> and then and my problem with reading books, and I'm trying to get really better at this, is I have 15 books on my nightstand and I have five books in my office and I tend to be reading lots of them all at different times, depending on what sparks my interest. So you're so just I'm making trying. soup. You're making soup. So, yeah. well, what's interesting Good is like soup. some of it ties yeah. together. Good soup, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so some of it ties together and then some of it doesn't. So some of it falls off or I'll be you know, listening to a podcast and someone will talk about a new book. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so great. Yeah. I got to go buy that. And so I buy it. So I am trying and have been trying the last six months, especially since I wrote my own book to really finish a book yeah. and to start reading a book and to finish a book and to really, you know, I highlight in books and I write notes and take tabs and stuff like that. And so really finding a way to effectively do that, you know, so I've been, I read Rise of the Reader. I don't know if you know Nick no, and read Rise no. of the Reader, but it's a great book about how to become a better reader. Oh, oh okay. Hutchinson, he's a great young guy. He's I'm dyslexic. Too. And I'm uh, dyslexic, he wrote a book so... called Rise of the Rise of the Reader. Yeah. yeah. I'm so not a he big wrote a book called Rise of the big Reader, listener. which is helpful. A big yeah. listener. Yes. Yeah. Which is I and I do find a lot of people who are writing a lot of these books have podcasts and mm-hmm. I think podcasts are great because you can listen to them speak and get the wisdom from them 
you know, while you listen to them speak. Mm. So I think so. Uh, so yeah, well, I've read about half of Matthew McConaughey's book. He, by the way, has like the coolest cover, like the jacket cover of his book I've ever seen. I have no idea who actually published his book, but his yeah. jacket cover is like half a jacket cover. I'm like, that is the most custom thing I've ever seen. It's so cool. I'm trying to remember what the, I think on the book I've got, because it could be different wherever it was published in the world. Right. It could be different. Um, correct. Yeah. Is I think it's him side, part side on with his hand on his chin. In yeah. a black and white photo, I think, on the green lights book. It's that about I've got. like that, but what they did for the dust jacket, so the dust jacket that goes over the hardcover in uh -huh. the US, it doesn't cover the full book. Oh, it's like a wrap. It's oh, nice. so, it's, I've never okay, seen cool. anything no, like I haven't it. Seen I have that. It's so cool. I was like, I that it. alone, you just are like standing yeah. out. Like, yeah. And I think he's super cool and has amazing messages. And I have huge respect for him. You know, uh, he's using his platform to do a lot of really good things. So, yeah, I think so as well. I think he's got a lot of going on there. And um, by the way, for all women, he's great looking too. Like, oh, yeah, there for you, you girls. Know. Yeah, right. There's that, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. He's a, we can't excuse that. He's, a he's kind good. of he's, he's easy he's on a, the eyes. Yeah. And he's a badass human being, you know, like he, exactly. he, he is. <laughs> One my wife is very big on, and I can't think of the name of the book, but it, I think it's Conversations. But whatever the book is called, it's Conversations Between the Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. Oh, I have heard of that book and I have not read it, uh -huh. but it I, sounds fascinating. I'm trying to think of the name of the book, but it won't come to me. I, but, but I know yeah. exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. Again, it's supposed to be really fascinating. Really, really incredible conversations. Yes. So with all this and, and this mindset and this drive forward, how, how does this relate to a house? How does this relate to a client who, you know, steps out of bed onto a cold floor on a Connecticut yeah. morning and yeah. um, kicks their toe as they walk around the corner of the, you know, bed post and right. yeah. stumbles into the shower. And how does it all relate? What, who it, cares? <laughs> it, no, but it does relate. It definitely does relate. So, and I talk about this in my book, there's a whole chapter on this about wellness and interior design and how you bring it all together. And I talk about it when I speak locally too. And and when I meet new clients, I always say to them, let's talk about something, you know, relatively personal, which is what do you see when you first open your eyes in the morning? What are you looking at? Are you looking at a piece of artwork that inspires you, a sculpture that inspires you? What's on the ceiling? I have black and white geometric wallpaper on the ceiling in my bedroom, which people are always like, you do? And then I show them a picture. I'm like, that's so cool. I'm like, I know it's out there, right? But I do actually love it. Like, what it do you works see? for you. It, yeah. it, it works. It works for me. I was like, what do you see? Or do you see laundry? Uh -huh. What do you see when you first open your eyes? And then I say, and then when you first step out of bed, what is the first sensory experience of your feet? Because your feet hold you up all day long and you're on them all day. What is that first sensory experience that you give to your feet when you step out of bed? Is it a cold floor? Is it a rug without a rug pad? Is it hard tile? Is it an old ratty carpet that you actually really hate and kind of brings a negative emotion? Or I use my own house as an example. I have the most beautiful plush, white, all white rug in my bedroom. And when I bought it, my rug vendor was like, are you sure? I'm like, I'm sure. We are going all white, like the whiter the white you can get because it is so soft and it is so plush. And I fell in love with it when I saw it. And, you know, and everyone knows in my house, like, don't touch mom's rug. Yeah. It's mom's rug. Yeah. Um, because that's the first sensory experience you give to your feet. And then when you walk into the bathroom, what's first of all, what's that path like to walk to the bathroom? You know, are you tripping over your laundry? Are there shoes on the floor? Like what is there into that path? And then what's the floor like? We live in New England. It's cold. It should be heated. If you're talking about designing anything, heat the floor in your bathroom Just, so that yeah. it's warm. Sensory yeah. experience. Your lights. People don't think about mm. this. Your light should be on a dimmer in your bathroom. It should be soft. You should have mm. your first light switch that you touch just be a few little sconces. That's it. Not the whole big ceiling. Or just even under lighting, just under lighting from the, the vanities. And, Something yeah. just a little subtle, you know, mm -hmm. and that's how you start to wake yourself up during the day. You know, and we could go on and on window treatments, light that comes in through, you know, what's the noise that you hear? We could go on mm. and on and on. But I start to talk to people about, you know, you have to really think about how does your house make you feel and how do spaces make you feel? And does the mudroom give you anxiety because you see everything and because of the disorganization? Well, okay, then guess what? Everything is going behind a door, you know, yeah. everything's going how can behind we, a door. How, can we, so, how right. can we nurture the, nurture you Correct. with design and put things, you know, away or 
put them in a place or make their journey simpler. Um, simpler and calmer. Yeah, calmer. Yeah. How can we how can calmer. we support you through this right. journey so that you right. get the best from your living space? From your living and your space. And you and I talked about this before. I talk mm. all the time that every Every home, no matter how big or small it is, should have a dedicated space that is your space to go and sit and be quiet and to turn your mind off. And it could be a chair. It could be a pillow on the floor. It could be an entire room. You could meditate, journal, read, just look out the window. And I, I describe it to my clients as the space. Imagine it as the space where there's an invisible do not disturb sign in front of you in that space. So anyone who happens to walk by, if you are in that space, they don't just talk leave. To me. Yeah, they just they leave. Just leave. They just leave because you're there and it doesn't matter what you're doing. You could just be sitting there with your eyes closed. You could be reading a magazine. You could be on Instagram. Doesn't yeah, matter. Doesn't matter. Ideally it's not your space. that's not quieting your mind, but it's your space. And you and I had talked about this earlier. I saw a reel on Instagram just yesterday of a woman who had created her space in her tiny New York City apartment. And it was between her bed and a wall. And all she had was a big white fluffy pillow. But she had, you know, behind her, she had candles and flowers and she was sitting on her pillow. And this is her space. And that is where she sits and she quiets her mind. And I encourage my clients to think about these spaces as where you go breathe. Where you go yeah. breathe in your home, yeah. where are you going to quiet your mind? And it could be five minutes, 10 minutes. And if you're having a really stressful morning or stressful day, go sit in that space for five or 10 minutes and just sit there be, and just breathe. Mm -hmm. And like, we need to learn how to just breathe and listen to what's going on. And that's why I say to people, just go look out the window, just go sit there and observe, mm -hmm. watch, oh, watch and, the animals, and, watch the cars, watch wherever, just just if you're in the right present. climate, add some nature to it, you know, and biophilic oh, design is always. so strong again. So, you know, adding some nature into your home, just, yeah, like it, it, it plants in every room. Yeah. Give your space, give yourself space to breathe and let breathe. a house nurture you. One of my breathe. big things with this is the materiality that we use. And mm -hmm. when I say materiality, we use, I'm saying as an industry, we use a lot of toxic materialities. You know, we use, there's a lot of glues, there's a lot of like VOCs that are in the environment, there's lots yeah. of EMFs that are in the environment. And these are things that we don't see, however, to have a, an overlaying energy in them. And yeah. I think our next chapter of design, whether that be architecturally or interior, is... And probably built off a fair bit from what's happened with COVID is a mm -hmm. deep, a deep look at wellness of our space. Right. Beyond building performance be and great. science, a deep right. look at wellness and how that supports us and into the building biology area of design. And right. then it's beyond that next piece, it's mental health. So it's emotional wellness. And yeah. Oh, you know, one. the placebo part of emotional wellness is you can use a fake plant if you need to right. versus a real plant. You know, if you can't keep Correct. plants alive, that you isn't a reason right. not to have plants. And, oh, yeah, you know, you can have fake plants that flower all year round <laughs> and, <laughs> you, and you don't ruin green. the carpet by watering. Right. them. You know, like, no, no. But the greenery brings the outdoors in, yeah. even if it's a faux plant. And the faux plants right now, I mean, there's some really great ones that are out there. They're, they're, that, they're you know, fantastic. I mean, they don't replace real. I love mm -hmm. real. But to your point, mm -hmm. there are lots of people who can't keep real alive. I would say to people. That you shouldn't have faux. Yeah, I would say to people, if you've got issues with real mix, take a couple of real and right. then put the rest in and fake. So I think right. this, my, this next chapter my sort of feeling that when I talk to lots of designers, interior architects, you yeah. know, and creatives is there's this overwhelming feeling of that, this wellness part of the mental health and the physical health of the client is at the forefront and that the architecture needs to respond to this and the interior needs to respond right. to this. And it's customizable down to an individual. It's not just having that and that because of the fact that those are the things, they're the trend. Right. It's what yes. is the person, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? What is the person? Right. What is what's the, the person? Best, and right. what's the best thing for that person? Yeah. Talking to you, what strikes me so much is, is that you're very aware of this and 
you also are very focused on finding that person. A, first as a client yeah. and them finding you. And then B, once they're a client and how to nurture that forward so that it fulfills their life, so that it becomes a piece of their life that's a stepping stone to the next piece and into every day. I love the, right. the journey you took us on with you know, what do you step out onto? What do you mm -hmm. first see? What do you need? What mm -hmm. what gives you certainty around you? And when you work with couples, how do you do that and blend it? How does one not dominate the to, other? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes people take a pause and really think. It's interesting yeah. to see when you ask these questions in person, how people's minds are are thinking, you know, mm. about those answers. I've know, got a question and... for you based around a personal question based around it. Yeah. In your home, mm -hmm. your favorite space, why and what emotion does it evoke? So that's a hard one because there are lots of parts of my house that I really I know and you're only allowed um, one. I know. But I'm you can choose one. anyone had... and it can be around a time zone. It could be around anything. Yep. You know, go. So if I had to choose one by far, it would be I have a chair in my bedroom that was my grandmother's. It used to be yellow and was falling apart. And I moved it around from house to house for 20 years saying, I'm going to reupholster this someday. And I finally decided, but I hadn't because I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with it and what color mm -hmm. did I want it to be. And I was, you know, my grandmother loved yellow and I actually love yellow and kind of get some flack from people. Like my painter, I have a room that's yellow and my painter's like, get rid of the yellow. I'm like, I'm sorry. I love the yellow. I'm leaving it. Sorry. Yeah. Yellow is my color of joy. It makes me happy. In my sunroom, it makes me happy. I don't want yeah. it in my bathroom, but in my sunroom, it makes me happy. But anyway, so this yellow chair of my grandmother's has been in my bedroom. For 20 years, not going with any decor and, you know, being the cushion was as hard as a rock. And, but it was a beautiful, I loved the lines at the back of the chair and I loved that it was yellow and I loved that it was my grandmother's. And so I finally decided to have it reupholstered. And that trip of my upholsterer coming to pick it up, he literally looked at me. He's like, why am I not throwing this in the dumpster again? And I was like, cause it's my grandmother's chair and we are going to remake it. He's like, you mean we're really remaking the whole thing? I was like, except for like the beautiful back frame and the sides of the arms, which is what I love so much about it. Yes, you're remaking the whole chair, but we're sure. keeping all of that. We're remaking the whole thing. So I put it a beautiful white fabric on it and it sits in the corner in my bedroom and I had a custom made black lacquered side table made to go next to it and then above it is a picture that belonged to my other grandmother that I had reframed and it's a chalk picture of a woman and it was in this awful frame and I took it out and had it reframed and everyone's like I can't believe that's the same thing and I was like I'm not I love new I love modern but I was like but these two things are sort of my history and I've taken my history and I've reupholstered it and made it new and it actually fits in a very modern black and white bedroom and this is my favorite spot because I sit in this chair every day and I have a very modern cool pillow on it and a cow hide poof for my feet and a cashmere throw for my legs and I you know reading lamp and I sit in this chair every day and I journal in it. I will meditate in it. I will read in it. Sometimes I just sit in it to breathe. I have a Himalayan salt foot thing that I put my feet on at the end of the day because it's hot or I'll just sit and look out the window. And so I would say it is the space in my home where I go to pause and where I go to breathe. And I love it, A, because it's beautiful and B, it has history and it has meaning to me. And it just gives me a huge sense of peace. And I am happy every time I sit there. And every time I sit there and then get up and leave, I always feel better. I always just feel more calm and I feel more at peace. And so that is my favorite part of my house. Better and better. I it's literally that. a corner, a corner in my house. And it is my favorite. And if you had to sum that up into one word of an emotion. Peace. Peace. Or peaceful. When you are uh, at peace or peaceful, what does that allow you to do and be? Uh, breathe better. <laughs> breathe better, smile more. You know, I can physically feel it. You know, I'm one of those people I carry all my stress on my shoulders, always have, you know, it's like this hunched thing all this time in front of a computer. So I can actually physically feel myself just let go and just be more present. I would say I journal every day about being present because I think it's, you have to work at being present. And I do a lot of mindset work and a lot of journaling and meditation and all that, but you got to work at being present. 
you know, you got to work on my mind moves fast. I'm a type A person and it's constantly talking to me all day long. So it's like, you got to work on being present. And so I think my space, in addition to it making me peaceful, it make it forces me to be very present with what's there now. And also very grateful because I always do. I always write every morning, three things I'm grateful for. And I do it when I sit in that chair. Mm. I love it. And it could be as simple as the fact that it's finally sunny after it's been raining for days or, you know, that my plant is growing so well next to me or, you know, the people in my lives or new clients or new opportunities or, you know, it can be big things, my house. And it could also be just little things that my rug is soft and I like how that feels on my feet. I think that always- is it's a beautiful thing. And one of the reasons I asked the question is, is because everybody has different spaces and different fulfillment from them and uh, when we tap into that we can be very mindful about what it is but then recognizing what it gives us as well where how it feeds us and then you can't give what you don't have so right. yes if exactly. you can't give what you yes. don't have then you, you then you can you at have, least correct. yeah you yep. get there mm-hmm. mm. yep. um you got it <laughs> yep one last question then. If yeah, this you've got to choose one last project. I ask this of most of my guests. One last project. Yeah, you can't do another project. This is it. Hang your hat up. That's your legacy. Whatever you've done's done. What would you choose? I would love to design something really modern but yet is in tune with nature. So, so something that's, you know, on a really large piece of property with a beautiful view and is incredibly modern and, but yet brings all of nature outside in, but yet has a feeling of coming home. And so modern yet incredibly comfortable and relaxing and inviting, but yet feeling like you're outside with nature. And the irony is, is like, if you asked me if I like to go camping, I'd be like camping to me is going to the Ritz Carlton. So like, I don't want that, but yet, but yet I love the ability to see the world outside of us. And so I would love to design something on a big, huge, beautiful piece of property with just views that just, you could just sit and look at all day long, see the sunrise, see the sunset, have it be really modern, but yet really comfortable and inviting as well. And also have it be filled with art because I think artwork is so inspiring and can say so much about a person. And I think it's fun to just always have something that tells a story about you and it makes a a house a home if you add art that has meaning. Mm. So that would be it. And then I would walk away with that. You'd be done. I'd be done. Yeah, I would. Because I would feel like I tackled wellness and health and feeling and emotion and my favorite styles of design, which tend to be more modern, even though I live in New England, which is not a very modern Mm. destination. But I think there's a way to do it where it can be very inviting, inviting, welcoming, calming, soothing, peaceful, and then including, you know, my passions for, you know, being art and creative creativity, you know, have a huge piano right in the center of a room. It would be so fun. Yes. Yes. And the quiet and peace. Yeah. Right. To have that space and yeah. the quiet and peace. You know, the reality yeah. is, is I would love, you know, I would love to live on a hundred acre farm. I think it'd be amazing. And because once again, I'm the introvert, that's an extrovert for a living, but I would love to be able, you know, to have horses and tons of dogs and a yard and be able to look at the mountains and yet have, you know, a lake. I would love to be able to be in touch with nature like that, but then go inside my really beautiful house and be happy and, into a really modern home as well into yeah exactly it's something yeah. that's really clean because I happen to, and maybe that's because I haven't been I wasn't raised in a very modern environment you know I live in a mm-hmm. very traditional New England town and so there isn't as much of that modern there's like you know mm-hmm. some Frank Lloyd Wright type of famous modern but there isn't a lot of modern and so I would love to push the, push the envelope of you know a uh, something that is really modern in an environment that you wouldn't expect modern where you would actually probably expect a cabin love it push the envelope a little bit that's awesome that's awesome so there you go well i thank you so much for such a amazing conversation and i know we could keep talking oh of course and we will i think i think we'll do some more definitely it it's engaging and also it take it journeys me so i'm hoping it journeys the audience as well 
Uh, for the audience, you, you can find Jean at JMA Designs and in Connecticut, but you know, I'm sure she'll go further than Connecticut for you. Of course. Um, and certainly New York. That when looking for somebody to work with, I think if you listen back through this and you and you look at what that is about and you know the kind of people that you're wanting to work with and you want to work with for you because it enriches their lives and your lives symbiotically. I think that this right. is a really beautiful thing. It's not it's not just making it look pretty. It's, it's not. that's a prerequisite that will happen anyway. Of it's course, about, any designer. Yeah. Yeah. That's the passport, you know, like you can't leave the country Correct. without that. It's right. got to do those things. But it's we we're, we're talking about going a whole lot deeper and a whole yeah. lot more connection and understanding. And, you know, you were saying before how clients become like family because you let them in that far and they let you in that far. So there's a lot of trust and vulnerability in the relationship. Absolutely. Beautiful. And joy. Yeah, the it joy. is. It's amazing it is. what you can do together and you end up pushing your, each other. 100%. Um, to create these spaces that, you know, not only are beautiful, but, you know, change people's lives for the better and make them happier and make them want to be better people. And along that journey, we talk about wellness and mindset and share interesting books and things that we learn. And, you know, everybody just kind of grows together and while we're designing something, you know, special and unique. And I believe every home should be unique to the person who lives in it. And it should really showcase who you are as a person and also who you want to grow into as well yeah I think yeah, yeah yeah I think both of those like it should be about you your past your and your future yeah and uh, you know grandma's chair was one of the yeah. little shiver moments that I took because yeah. I love that you know grandma actually kept that chair as it was when you got it yeah for many years before many you years. She, before she let you change it before I, right, before I was allowed to change it, really, exactly. when you think about it. Yep, exactly. A long time. Grandma's perfect it. plan of, Our, uh, of, and of holding, is, holding you. Of holding it until a, I was tight. ready. Yeah. Until I was just ready to make yeah. it the perfect chair. And it is, it's, it is absolutely the perfect chair. I post on Instagram all the time. So if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see the chair. Go look for the chair. <laughs> Go look for the chair. You'll see the mm. white chair. It's definitely there. Jane, magical conversation. Thank you so, so much for your time. Oh, Adrian, really appreciate it's great. it. The time has been so fun. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly uh, a pleasure and an honor. Absolutely. We'll talk again soon. Great. Look forward to it. Ciao. Hi, guys. I'm Adrian. I'm your host of Talk Design Podcast. I started this podcast a couple of years ago and in doing it, my aim was to talk to amazing design people, creative minds, people who I could learn from and hopefully you could learn from. This was a big part of my whole reasoning for starting the podcast. We've cracked over 80 episodes and we've done two homes tour specials for the AIA Austin in Texas which have been really great fun, talking just specifically about houses. We've talked to HGTV stars. We've talked to building designers, interior designers, architects, business coaches, and some inspired characters along the way. People who have captured my imagination and their creative output and gone, huh, these people would bring a story to somebody else and maybe inspire them to go a little further with what they're doing as well. So I wanted to reach out and ask you all for some advice because you are the guys who tune in and listen and subscribe and I really appreciate that. So I want some advice from you. If you guys would be happy to share with me, A, what you like best so that I can better direct what we cover as content and then also, if there's things you want to solve, what are the three biggest things you would like information on? What are those kind of keys so that I can look and go, okay, let's find somebody who speaks specifically on these points and get some depth of information back to you that would be really useful in your business or in your life or in your home, whichever one it would be. So if I could ask you to do that, I would be forever grateful if you would share with me 
just through the email based on the Talk Design website, which is www.talkdesign.show. If you could just reach out by that email and say to me, hey, this would be a really great subject for me, for my business or for my family or for my home or for the way I want to see life. I would love to be able to support you guys and find those people that we could talk to that would bring that to you. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen. I so appreciate the fact that you listen to the podcast. It makes it all the more fun when I get messages from you to say, hey, this inspired me. I had somebody who sent me one the other day that said, your podcast, and we were talking on a certain subject, it was a game changer for me. It was a game changer in how I viewed how I was looking at what I was doing with my design and what was going to come from that. So these things make it all the more worthwhile. So please, if you could tell me top three things that would be useful to you, I would love to support you guys in delivering that. Thank you and thank you for being a listener. Take care, have a wonderful day, evening, wherever you are, whatever it is. Cheers, Adrian, over and out.